YouTube. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video, Mr. Terry, as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today's video is part two of the Extra History mini-series on the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, so if you did not see part one, I suggest going back and uh, should be easy to find um, and do that and then come back so you can uh, follow us. And um, this episode okay is titled trench fever so basically what what had kind of transpired so far is um it talked about at least with the information they they've they've uh, presented was that uh, the night uh, the the flu um in 1918 this this specific strain of the flu um started coming to america around 1918 and other parts of the world and had started to spread itself throughout uh, American military camps and training bases. And now, uh, and thousands were getting sick. Anyway, because they're, they're getting ready, they're training up very quickly to try to uh, get involved here in World War One. And now they're heading over to the trenches, which, as you can imagine, is a place that's going to be a breeding ground for um, for spreading of this disease and that's one of the reasons why this killed so many people and was so vast was because of the conditions of World War One exacerbated uh, exacerbated this very very deadly and dead uh, deadly strain of the flu and they talked um, in the first episode how estimates run from about f uh, 50 all the way up to 100 million dying of this which is if you're on that high end of 100 million that's basically World War One and World War Two combined so it's pretty crazy. So we're going to go ahead and jump in here. The original video will be down below. Make sure you go down, click that, so you get them a view, like, subscribe, all that stuff. And if you haven't subbed to my channel and you'd like to see more of History Teacher uh, reacting and uh, giving commentary or whatever, uh, perspective, then love to have you around as a sub, too. And hit those notifications so you can come hang out with us uh, with our live stuff. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. This is Episode 2, Trench Fever of the 1918 Flu Pandemic. So it's the war. It's stalked into camp when the day was damp and chilly and cold. It crept by the guards and murdered you know my guards with a hand that was clammy and bony and bold. And its breath was icy and moldy and dank, and it killed so speedy and gloatingly greedy that it took away men from each company rank. Private Joshua Lee, 34th Infantry Division, 1919. Okay, let's do it. Helmets on. When we left off, Going the 1918 war. flu was aboard troop transports headed for the battlefields of France. And though this first wave of the virus was comparatively mild, its time in the trenches would reforge it into a hardened killer of men and help tip the balance of the war. Now, I don't remember them saying as much about pre-existence of the flu there because they kind of been following the American like uh, experience with this flu. Um, but I'm assuming it had far, you know, bigger reach at this time than just with Americans. So keep that in mind. In early April, it erupted among the American troops at their disembarkation ground in Breste. By April 10th, the first cases began showing up in the French army, which generally trained and served alongside American units. It okay. was hard to notice at first. High fever, headache, and weakness could come from many diseases that swirled around the trenches. I mean, it was the, this, the war has been going on for four years, uh, you know, about by, by this time. And there's a lot of reasons to get sick. Trench conditions were terrible. People are always getting sick. There's rotting corpses and dead rats and malnutrition and um, all kinds of different things. So you could see how this would just not be identified as much. Plus, and we talked about this in the first episode, how impossible it would have been to... Uh, to, to, like, quarantine and do all that kind of stuff because they're have to do this training and be in close quarters because the deadliest war in history is going on at this time. Such as insect-borne trench fever or typhus. But it soon became clear that this was different. The troops called it three-day fever, knock-me-down fever, or la grip. It rarely killed, but men who got it were out of action for days and lead-footed for weeks. The overcrowded camps and trenches of the Western Front were ideal tinder for an epidemic. Men lived within inches of each other, their immune systems compromised from exhaustion and disease. And unlike a city where the virus might run out of victims, here, fresh bodies were rotated onto the line every few days. It spread to the British in early May. Constant movement. It's like the opposite of quarantining, right? And by then, there was no hope of containment. It swept through them like a bad spirit. English hospitals saw over 36,000 admissions for flu in a single month. 
Only then, when it began undermining the troops' ability to fight, did military doctors raise the alarm. The outbreak had sprung up during a critical phase of the war. The Germans had launched a massive spring offensive, and Allied generals needed every man possible on the line. But as spring turned to summer, yeah, the th front this was kind of the um, what they're talking about this this initiative. Once the Americans started landing, the Germans saw, you know, you know, basically thought, rightfully so, that this they need to make their push now because with the Americans now starting to come in. It's not going to be going very well because late here in the war, things aren't going very well. I mean, people are running out of their troops and supplies and the death tolls are outstanding. So the Germans were like, all right, this is going to be the big push. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting in Germany, right? Which they haven't been. They've been fighting in Belgium. They were fighting when we're talking about the Western Front. Because in the Eastern Front, you guys know that that part of the war was over. Um, after the 1917 revolution and the treaty eventually that is signed between the new uh, government in um, what's now going to be the Soviet Union... And of that, which then was able to put troops to the West. So good timing for a big offensive here to try to make a big push to to try to turn this thing. Because it had been, been a stalemate on the Western Front. So that's kind of the context of what's happening here. And Allied generals needed every man possible on the line. But as spring turned to summer, the frontline hospitals of the Allies swelled to overcapacity. Men on the front lines would get ready to rotate to the rear, only to find that the unit ordered to relieve them had instead gone into quarantine. Medical tents had run out of space, and some hospitals took to laying patients outside on canvas tarps. Wow. In late May, a group of French recruits can't handle all the um, the people. People fear that you know with stuff with stuff currently about, and this is just the military camps. Um, but can the medical services handle large amounts of people at one time? Um, you find out it's very difficult. Roots came down with it. 69% of them had to be hospitalized and 5% died. By the end of the summer, 10% of the British Army had fallen ill. Back in Washington, D.C., Welch and his epidemiologists finally took notice. The flu, previously ignored, became a matter of national security. They set about turning the Rockefeller Institute into an information gathering and communications center for the disease. Welch wanted anything he could get his hands on reports, lung samples, information on treatment, so he dispatched doctors to centers of infection to swab throats and collect samples. This guy is, uh, it's been interesting. They introduced him in the first episode, how he was very cutting edge in medical research uh, at this time and made this, what they call the Roosevelt Institute or whatever, became a, a big place for the study. And this guy uh, sounds like he's going to be a big, or play a big role in this. But all of it remained a closely guarded secret. No one wanted the central powers to know that the Allies were being weakened by disease. Sure. Upon entering the war, both the U.S. and Britain had clamped down on the press with unprecedented censorship measures. When American officers denied or minimized reports of the flu, newspapers at home accepted it without question. The British, for their part, tried to strangle any mention of the spreading plague. But with the virus now infecting the civilian population, news of an epidemic started to leak. I got to insert here what World War I did to people's relationship to media during wartime. World War I was full of propaganda, tons of propaganda, right? And we find out a lot of it was kind of fabricated. It was, it was much easier to control the narrative of a war in these earlier times because there aren't as many maybe publications and, uh, and access to media. Right. So you're you're very limited in what you can actually get access to. So people are far more likely to accept what is told to them in media. Um, and also in this era it is a lot easier for the government also to control those messages. Right. So after World War One, though, when they start figuring out numbers and there was a lot of propaganda and a lot of lies that went into this war, it did start to change people's view of the media, especially during wartime, and to become a little bit more skeptical of the news that does come out. Because one thing we know about, you know, uh, uh, warfare is warfare needs to be conducted largely, almost completely, with public opinion. So the news and things being reported for war and the motivation for war always needs to be uh, in a positive way that emphasizes your being there reasons for you being there and then potentially villainize your enemy and just to connect this one last thing is uh, one of the things that's been very critical of world war ii was the ignorance towards uh the genocides that were happening right 
in Europe, the Nazi Party or the Jap- uh, Japanese in China and stuff like that. And there were, you know, minimal amounts of reports about these things happening at those times. But they were largely ignored and brushed off as propaganda because that had been their recent history. There's no way these things could be true. It's hard to actually figure that out. And it's kind of a crying wolf thing that eventually, you know, one of these things could be very bad and it could be and true and be very late. So I don't know if there's an element of that happening here. But they are talking about how people still definitely trusted the sources at this time. But then things, are, it seems like, are starting to change. In May, the virus arrived in Madrid. And since Spain was neutral, it wasn't subject to wartime censorship. There, the flu made front page news, especially once it infected the king. It- Prediction. So Spain is getting it. They're out of the war. By the way, neutral in World War One and World War Two. Spain gets it. King's going to get it. It's going to make big headlines, which is where you might get the idea of the Spanish flu, which is a really not accurate term at all. There, the flu made front page news, especially once it infected the king. It whipped through Spanish cities, passing from person to person so fast that local wits named it after a hit opera song, The Naples Soldier. It was as catchy as the song, the joke went, if more deadly. International newspapers picked up the story on the Madrid outbreak and, erroneously, assumed the disease had originated there. And from those articles, the killer gained another name, the Spanish flu. I see. So it was an accident. It was an accident. People didn't understand the um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the path of this because there was America and before that it was coming from China and probably a bunch of other places too. So it wasn't being uh, tracked very well. Which, yeah, if you don't have that education on it, then more likely to yeah, misname things, misrepresent things. But it wasn't just the Allies covering up the flu's impact. On the other side of no man's land, the German commander, General Ludendorff, was also wrestling with the disease. Ludendorff had gained day-to-day command of the German military in 1916, along with a huge amount of political power, and he'd used it to embark on a bold plan to save the Kaiser and Germany. And to be honest, it hadn't gone so well. Well, is Germany, I mean, they don't have it immediately yet. That's what I'm getting the impression. The Germans don't have it because, I mean, if you're coming in contact, if you're like the French and Americans coming in t- contact with the Germans, because this is not as much hand to hand and stuff, I guess you could spread it that way. It'd be hard, but I wonder when it transfers there. First, he'd planned to crush the Allied supply lines with unrestricted submarine warfare. Instead, it had helped drag America into the conflict. Now, 84,000 Americans were arriving on the Western Front each month. But that would be a surmountable problem if he could knock Russia out of the war and free up the troops fighting on the Eastern Front. Luckily for him, a revolution had broken out against the Tsar. Germans got very fortunate there with the, um, uh, the well, two revolutions happened in 1917. One, basically, uh, the February one, which kicks out the Russian monarchy, and then the one later uh, at the end of the year, in the fall and October, uh, the one that brings in the communist government. And part of their platform with Vladimir Lenin was get Russians out of the war because the war was going terribly for Russia. And to fuel the chaos, he helped transport a famous Bolshevik revolutionary, one Vladimir Lenin, back to Russia. The plan worked. Kinda. This is such an interesting story uh, that I didn't learn till till a little bit later on, till I was uh, like, a, like a real history student was that Lenin was exiled out of Russia to, uh, I believe, Switzerland and was this revolutionary, you know, anti, uh, against the monarchy. And the Germans got wind of this guy and were like, hey, we can use this guy for our advantage. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to basically get him on a train with, like, weapons, guns, and basically get him equipped to start a revolution from within in Russia. And having a basically on a good relationship with him in a way or at least an understanding that he would want to get russia out of the war and of all the things that the germans really gambled on for example the schlieffen plan um, assuming that russia would take longer to mobilize than what they uh actually did which they were hoping they could do a, a western front war and then move to an eastern front but russia got uh they mobilized faster so they had to do two front war that was one of the gambles and also one of the big gambles i like to refer to is germany thinking that invading belgium would not necessarily bring the english into the war which also failed so about the the, the gambles they've been making this was one that did work out 
because it exactly happens. They're able to smuggle him in with what he needs to start a revolution, and it works, and pulls Russia out of the war, which really uh, helped the Germans out. Ludendorff had hoped the strict peace terms he'd foisted on Russia would scare other allies into opening negotiations. But instead, Didn't. the harsh treaty only had convinced them that peace was not possible until they achieved total victory. Exactly. If it's going to be harsh, why would people go for that then? Like, we don't want it to be like that. Maybe if it was a nicer treaty, which didn't strip all this territory and all these other things that it did, maybe people would have been more likely to uh, to, to, uh, to to negotiate. Um, especially because at this point in the war, the Germans, in, in the war, the Germans were seen as the aggressor, as they were the ones that did the invasion. And forced an equally punishing treaty on Germany. But at least Ludendorff now had his 50 divisions from the Got eastern him. front. And he'd use them for one more, all or nothing shot at winning the war. He'd retrained the freed up veterans as assault specialists, stormtroopers, and launched his massive spring offensive in hopes of securing victory before the Americans arrived in force. As the offensive began, Ludendorff's army had better trained troops, superior tactics, higher morale, and for a brief time, numerical superiority. And at the beginning, it all went so well. German troops had captured more territory than they had since 1914 and driven a wedge between the British and the French. Yeah, the, the invasion there they're going to do here late was successful. Um, at least they were able to get deeper than they ever had before. But the Allies had held on to the strategic port roads and railroad junctions. All the ground that Ludendorff captured was worthless, shell-churned dirt. And they'd taken a lot of casualties. So the next phase of the operation was critical. But as he began to organize for a final push, his generals requested a delay. The German army, you see, had the flu. They'd caught it. Bad timing. It's, it looked like for them they were starting to get advantage. I think they know this is now becoming a war of resources that if it goes on, they're going to lose, right? Because America's resources are going to be virtually unlimited. And Germany's running out of them. Yeah, they might be able to get more troops because they've been able to shift troops from the east to the west. But this is like the worst thing that could happen to Germany at this moment because they need everything to work for them. They need all ever all the the stars to align, right? Late in June, probably from a British prisoner of war, and by July it was sweeping the ranks. Interesting. Okay, so we're getting the impression that yeah, the Germans had not had it up to this point. It's nineteen nineteen now, I guess. Uh, well, I guess it could be it's eighteen, but to move into 19 here and it came from a british prisoner of war that's interesting if they can track it back to one instance german troops their systems already weak from food rationing appeared especially susceptible to infection half a million soldiers were sick in some units a quarter of the men were too ill to fight ludendorff delayed the attack five days after that the commanders would just have to deal with the reduced unit strength uh, Meanwhile, the Allies, who had caught the flu earlier... Did 500... I mean, they got sick. 500,000 500, got sick, but did they have to to sit out of the invasion? Because that would... I mean, half a million, that's critical. The spring and summer were recovering. Despite sickness, exhaustion, and casualty depletion, on July 15th, the German army marshaled for their one last attack. A rolling bombardment pounded the French and American lines as they advanced. Stormtroopers rushed behind with fast-moving infiltration tactics. Gas shells turned the battlefield into a chemical hell. But the French, British, and Americans held and counterattacked. And they would keep counterattacking for a hundred days, pushing the Germans back step by step. At critical costs. When you look at casualties of the war, and you look at them, you look at like America, for example, and it's a very small number in comparison uh, to other numbers. But what you, you have to keep in mind is how, like, for, for the Americans, how short of a time they were actually there. So deaths per day or something like that, where do you want to do it, are incredibly high for the Americans. And and it would have been for anybody that was involved in this, because a counterattack is uh, often deadly, because you are going to have to sacrifice them, because you're not holding back, you are pushing yourself into an already charging enemy, which leaves you very exposed and undefended. Ludendorff had failed. Within weeks, he was Wars shut over in his now. office, really? suffering a nervous breakdown. And by October, he was fleeing across the Swedish border in sunglasses and a fake beard. <laughs> Dude, accept it, right? Accept your failure. Don't abandon them. Fear for yourself. Going to Sweden. What'd the Swedes do? Now, it would be wrong to say the flu defeated Ludendorff's spring offensive because there were other it factors. It didn't help. It was an overambitious operation with a nebulous goal. 
He kept changing the objectives, units outran their supply lines, and he lost too many men. But German accounts do suggest the flu bled the army's manpower and resolve at a critical moment. And just as it had tipped the balance, it was gone. In August, British <laughs> hospitalizations fell to the point that they had declared the epidemic over. Prediction, it's not over. This is what happens with pandemics. They start to go away because you're putting in those measures. You get overly confident. And then it comes back. Okay, because um, seasons also make an impact from what I understand about these types of pandemics. And then they can come back, um, sometimes in a new strain, and very often worse the second time around. But it wasn't over. For as the balance of the war was shifting, so were the virus's genes. Even today, no one's sure what happened. Perhaps the original, deadly virus had temporarily mutated into a mild strain, only to have its lethality mm. reemerge. Or it may have infected someone, even an animal, that had a different version of the flu and the two viruses combined. With the way that bacteria is replicated, such a uh, bacteria or uh, viruses, anything, you know, whatever, uh, they replicate at such a rate that they evolve at a pace that's uh, unlike anything else in, in the whole natural world. I'm not, a, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a chemist, but from what I understand there, they can rapidly change more than basically any other living thing, um, living or non-living thing uh, that, that exists because of its uh, replication, how fast it can replicate into making you know millions, billions of copies. It's even possible that, as it passed through millions of soldiers, this avian virus was gradually adapting itself to human hosts. Most frightening of all, the war itself may have given it a nudge, because the soldiers the flu infected had been exposed to a chemical agent known to cause genetic mutation, mustard gas. Oh, I actually didn't know a lot about the um, biological changes that mustard gas would do you know you heard about that, that with like nuclear uh, nuclear radiation or like the products we use in vietnam like agent orange and stuff which have been known to cause cancer and deformation or uh, deformations and and all that stuff but i didn't know necessarily of that although i had heard it it can affect like brain chemistry and stuff um one of the the things i've heard about before was it's i, don't, I think it's fairly fringe of an idea uh, having to go with Adolf Hitler, actually, that you know Adolf G Hitler was exposed to gas and had a really bad gas attack at the end that it might have screwed up his brain chemistry, making him more irritable and aggressive, um, which is kind of interesting. But I don't know it had necessarily genetic effects that way. The soldier's throat and lung cells laced with chemical weapons may have helped increase the rate of genetic shift and raise the likelihood that a new strain would develop. However it happened, the virus that emerged from the trenches was both highly contagious and severely lethal. It could kill within 24 hours of presenting symptoms, drowning a patient in their own fluids. And while common flu strains primarily kill the very old and very young, the 1918 flu struck people down in the prime of life. The mild first wave was over. So you're not, yeah, you're not just talking about healthy people or, you know, sorry, um, old people or people that are immune, to, um, uh, immune susceptible. Uh, it's regular healthy people like you know these soldiers going in yeah the conditions are bad but going in you know these are some of the people in the peak health of your entire life and the second lethal wave was about to begin in fact it was already making itself known on the troop ships delivering soldiers to nations across the globe the naples soldier was on the march and the soldiers coming back okay all right, so yeah, yeah, this this makes sense from what I've understood about it is things like this can come dormant and then hit new new levels, new waves. It looks like that's going to happen because you can imagine like the war is going to be over, going to be very excited, people coming back. Maybe it looks like the 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 flu is kind of running its course or whatever. And so all the precautions are kind of done with, you know, if they are doing quarantines, any anything else to try to distance and then it's lying dormant and, and evolving, right? The strain, and then can come back when you maybe think it's safe. Maybe you you, you know you you you're a little bit too uh, too anxious, right? To or, or or what's the word I'm thinking of here? You uh, really underestimate it, I guess. And it looks like that's going to happen because I thought I had heard that 
that this had happened, that it kind of did its thing in 1918, then laid dormant for maybe 1919, and then 2019 or 1920 comes back and was uh, had the highest casualties then in its sort of second round, if you want to call it that way. So, all right. Well, um, a lot of just discussion about the war here, which was really cool. Um, they, you know, they, they did at least half of it was mostly on the war itself, which, I mean, you have to do because it's in the context of the war. But now that, I mean, they haven't said the end of the war yet, you know, gone over the events of the end of the war, but that's probably coming here in episode three. And then we'll, yeah, we'll see the next wave. I'm interested to see what changes, if they talk about, or what, what precautions were they making at home? Because I think these are important lessons, you know, for, for what we can learn um, right now. And yeah, what precautions they were making. And then uh, what did that second sort of wave look like and how was it different? What can we, you know, potentially learn from that? Look at the conditions um, there, especially once the war is over, right? And maybe some normalcy in day-to-day -day life can can start to happen all right awesome this is great uh, i can see why it was recommended even before this was recommended to me even before you know people now are very interested in all of a sudden the 1918 flu with the pandemics going, uh, going on right now but uh, this was recommended to me before and now it's become i think again very relevant why i picked this uh series to to kind of go over and uh go through with with you guys so all right awesome okay good stuff all right this is a good video Again, go down below before you uh, move on to whatever else you're doing today and click on the link in the description to the original video. Give it a like, subscribe, review, all that kind of stuff. And make sure you stay tuned for episode three. So make sure you are subbed and enable those notifications and uh, try to come out to a live premiere if we're doing one. Uh, those are fun to, to chat with people. Join our Discord server if you'd like to be part of our community. we got over 6,000 people there and a pretty tight-knit, uh, very active community. They can get involved in and talk about all kinds of things. So, All right, with that, we'll go ahead and end it here, and we'll see you next time. Bye.